In the beginning, there was nothing. That is, nothing but the two beings that we know of now as the Father and the Son. They were the only sentient beings who existed. In fact, they were the only life at all that existed. At the core of who and what they are is love. But their love is not a selfish love of caring only for those who care for them. Their love <clears throat> is a love that desires to serve others. Their love is so powerful that they desired to create a family to share in their love. For great expanses of time, they planned for the life that they would create to bring this family to pass. And a good designer tries to anticipate the multiple possibilities and so then reworks what is not best until it is. Let's begin today in Psalm 18. We're going to turn to a number of verses today, but I'm going to make it easy on you as well, because most of what I'm going to do is just tell you a story. And we'll highlight it with a few verses from time to time. Psalm 18, verse 30, specifically the last part of the verse. But as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the eternal is proven. He is the shield to all those who trust him, that God proved his word time and time again. And the Hebrew there is very interesting. It has a meaning to be refined, that God refined his way of life until it was perfect. In fact, we read, and you don't need to turn there, Psalms 12 and verse 6, where it says, The words of God are pure. Consider how God, in his great and infinite wisdom, thought out all the systems of the universe, all the laws of science and creation, even this planet, how it needed to be in order to sustain life, of how that life needed to be created in order to be sustained, of the variety of life to be created, and how all of it needed to exist in harmony and to be able to stand the test of time. How could he know that it would all work in harmony? He tested it. We can read in other places in scripture. He tested it again and again and again, four or five, six times, finally seven, until it became perfect. He knew all the variables. He knew all the possibilities. And he brought life together in a way that would only work one way. But the words of God are not just what he expressed to create the universe. Those words are also included in his law. God gives us instruction according to his law. Obey your parents. Keep the Sabbath. Don't lie. Don't kill. Don't have any other God. He has thought all of these things through and through and knows that they work. But a law isn't a law if there's no penalty, if there's no consequence, if there's no wrong. With the eternal nature of the law, there's also a built-in penalty, a byproduct, if you will, if the law is broken. I can pretend gravity doesn't affect me in my circumstance, but the penalty is very real if I violate that law. If violating the law goes far enough afield, too far, then there's conflict, there's hurt, there's pain and in extreme cases, death. Conversely, if we keep the law in the way that God knows that works, if we work within the parameter of how life is established, then there are blessings and there are positive consequences. And as we read in other verses as well, there's life forevermore. At some point, perhaps millions, if not billions of years ago, we have no way of knowing at this point, the Godhead completed their designs for life, and so then they created through the word. Let's go next to Psalm 33. Psalm 33 and verse 6. We read here, by the word of the eternal, the heavens were made. By his word, he expressed it, and it came into being. And all of the host of them, by the breadth of his mouth. This is very similar to what we read in John 1 verse 1. The word spoke and it existed. God here, as we read in Psalm 33, 6, began expanding their family with the creation of this angelic realm. The host of them can also mean the angels, not just the universe as a whole. And with this angelic realm then, God began to create outside of himself, outside the physical limitations of space and time. 
They started by creating powerful spirit beings here, referred in Scripture as angels. Let's go next to Hebrews chapter 1. He created these angels to assist him in his plan of salvation. Hebrews 1 and verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? That God will send them on various tasks to take care of things, to report, to oversee certain things that he's doing to bring forth his plan of salvation. And we don't rightly know how many angels there are, but we have Revelation 5, 11 that hints at potential billions in terms of numbers. And after this angelic realm was created then, the Godhead created the physical universe. Let's go next to Job chapter 38. And a manifestation of their power, they didn't build the universe in segments. It didn't come along piecemeal, here apart, there apart, until they had what they wanted. Like the angels when they were created, God spoke and it, exist, it, it existed. In Job 38, we find an expression of this. Job 38, verse 4, we read God here speaking to Job to bring him to some of this humility that we covered in the sermonette. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? By extension, he's saying, if you can answer me, let me know. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened or laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. They were there when God created the universe and it was so impressive that they shouted with joy. We're awed at just the limited amount of what we can see out there as the scientists peer deeper and deeper into these things. The massive nebulas, the stars that would encompass most of our solar system, and all that's out there and the variety and the abundance and just the sheer beauty in most cases. They shouted when they saw all of this come into existence. In this time before humanity was created, peace and love reigned supreme in the God family. As they were God, as, as they were love rather, this emanated out in everything that they did. But then a major change occurred. In spite of the beauty, the harmony, and the love of God, rebellion entered the picture. This rebellion came from arrogance, selfishness, vanity, pride. This holy day is special in its own way, just like all the other holy days. There's a unique aspect of it that points us to another element of God's plan of salvation. This day pictures a time when all of mankind will be at one with God. This day pictures the fall of Satan. And so this sermon is simply the story of the fall of Satan. I'd like to read to you next a doctrinal statement that we have in our fundamental belief booklet regarding Satan. We write, we believe that Satan is a spirit being who is the adversary of God and the children of God. Satan has been given dominion over the world for a specific time, and Satan has deceived humanity into rejecting God and his law. Satan has ruled by deception with the aid of a host of demons who were rebellious angels, spirit beings who followed Satan in his rebellion. Let's look at this a little bit more in Isaiah chapter 14. Satan was not created as Satan. You know, the, the sort of trick question is, did God create a devil? No, he did not. Lucifer became the devil. In Isaiah 14, we have one of these glimpses behind the curtain, if you will, in Scripture. This is sometime way back in prehistory. How long after the creation was it before Satan rebelled? We have no way of knowing. But knowing God, is, he is expressed through his word. I have to think that he did not let this go unaddressed. 
that he talked to these angels. He talked to Lucifer. He told them how this would end. He was the one who created life. He knew how this would work, how it would go. And yet ultimately they chose a different path. Isaiah 14, verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And there's this stark contrast then between God and his love and Satan and his attributes. Satan weakens by the characteristics and the attitudes that he broadcasts. Verse 13, for you have said in your heart, and I'm always impressed if that's the right word. I'm, I always take note when I read this section of how many statements are I will. This is the arrogance and the pride. Notice, I will ascend into heaven. The inference is above God. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. Again, by extension, he thought he could replace God. I will become God, is what he's saying. On the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Instead of being a leader, instead of being one who God gave such great attributes and using them in a positive way in God's service, he became rebellious. He became an adversary, and the name itself, Satan, means adversary. The Greek translation of the Old Testament uses the word diablos, which we get our word devil from. In the Greek, the name has the meaning of an accuser. We'll read more about that as we progress here, but as I stated, how long did it take for Satan to get to this point? And how many conversations did God have with him? We're not told, but we are told that in his haughtiness and in his anger, he persuaded a third of the rest of that angelic realm to follow him. Let's look at that in Revelation 12. In spite of the beauty that they saw in the creation, the sheer power and the mind of God being expressed through his will, they decided on whatever level, that he was not fair, that it was not right, that they were going to take what he would not give them. Revelation 12 and verse 4, this is talking about the end time and when Satan is thrown out of heaven, but it gives us this insight as to how many demons there are potentially. And it says, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, a third of the angelic realm. Now, as an aside, there are some who make a great deal of the point of a matter of how particular organizations are governed. And yet here we have a perfect family, a perfect government, and yet there was still rebellion in it. It all comes down to the heart, the humility that we've touched on even already today. The verse goes on to describe some of the things that then happen in the end time. But the followers of Satan then now are referred to as unclean spirits or demons. Satan rebelled and enticed a third of that angelic realm to follow him in his rebellion because he opposes God's plan. And there's been debate as to perhaps why he might have done this. Was it because he saw what God was doing or going to do next in terms of creating man and the potential of what man had and being in God's family that the angelic realm does not. We don't know, at least at this point, we don't know. But nonetheless, he rebelled and he brought sin into God's creation. We'll be back to this section of Revelation if you want to put a marker here, but let's go next to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 is a parallel account to Isaiah 14 earlier, but it gives us a little more information here. Ezekiel 28 and verse 16. This gives us insight that Satan works through human instruments and can influence them to do things contrary to God's law. His instruction, in this case, the king of Tyre, is a representation of that. 
Ezekiel 28 and verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the eternal God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. We know this is not talking about the king, but rather the power behind the king because of what's being described here. We could not say of any individual human, You are the seal of perfection. This is describing Satan. Notice verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. God decked him out. Maybe it was his beauty. Maybe it was in his intelligence that began to build this pride in him. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. There's the account in Exodus 25 talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the, the men that worked the metal were to make these cherubs for the mercy seat that sat on the Ark of the Covenant it seems that Lucifer was one of those two angels that covered the throne of God. He says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of firing stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until sin was found in you. Sin at the most simplistic level is simply saying or doing the opposite of what God wants done. Verse 16, by the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the firing stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground and laid you before kings that they may gaze at you to see what would be the result of this. And yet mankind has not paid attention. There are other indications that he was at least equal rank with the archangel called Michael. Jude 9 and Daniel 12 gives us a hint at that. But let's go next to John chapter 8. Because of this rebellion and this arrogance, this pride and his sinfulness, it changed him. And in John 8, we find it expressed as Christ states here that his very nature turned to something evil. John 8 and verse 44, Christ here condemning the leadership of the day because they, much like we read in the sermonette, they didn't see the disconnect. They thought if they did certain things outwardly, that made them righteous, no matter what their heart was. So John 8 and verse 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. I suspect when Christ said this, it went in one ear and out the other. They couldn't imagine. They were probably angry that he would even think to state this this way. But in doing so, they missed the point completely, didn't they? A murderer from the beginning, because of his hatred for God and his plan, Satan became this accuser. He became the destroyer. We'll look at that in a moment. He became the antithesis of everything that God wanted. Let's go back to Revelation 12 and verse 9. Revelation 12 and verse 9, then speaking again of Satan as this dragon in the end time. He says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, the serpent that was in the garden that deceived man from the beginning, 
called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels, the demons, were cast out with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. This is why God does not like division in the body. This is why God says to go reconcile with your brother. This is why God does not like gossiping and slandering. Because this is all from Satan. I can only imagine how tired God gets of hearing Satan come before him and saying, Did you see? Did you hear? And yet, how many times do we do this? And so one of the great questions in life that people think about without talking about is, why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there war, famine, disease, corruption? There are many people that use this viewpoint of saying, well, if there is evil and there is a God, then he's not a God I should worship. And so they walk away from religion not understanding this whole aspect of a reality they don't see that we're talking about here today. That they're talking about the wrong God, a God with a little g that controls right now the affairs of men. They say if God is all-knowing and all-powerful, then why doesn't he step in to stop all the terrible things that happen in the world? Why do young children get horrible diseases and die? Why do the good people face such horrible things? And yet evil men, if they use that word, succeed and seem to prosper. One of the catalysts for Charles Darwin setting out on his now famous voyage to come to be able to put together the thoughts of evolution that he promoted was because of the death of his young daughter. He could not put that in a context that he could understand why God would do it, allow it. And yet this is the criticism of many who choose to reject God as an authority of how life should be lived. And so Satan whispers in their ear and says, you can be your own authority. But it's a valid question nonetheless if someone's truly seeking to understand. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is that in order for mankind to develop godly character, in order for mankind to have the potential to be in the God family, there has to be free will. They have to be able to choose. Otherwise, there's no choice and there's no character. I'm simply being told or programmed to do certain things. And so in giving mankind free will, there was the possibility to choose not to live according to God's instruction. But God's law at its core is an expression of love. It is an expression of who he is. And so any violation of that law is what God calls sin. Let's look at that short definition in 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin, whoever acts in opposition to the law, commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin is, at whatever level, a violation of law. And law is simply an expression of God's character. So sin is opposition to God. This this disobedience then to God's law has brought all the suffering we see in the world around us. Mankind wants to point the finger somewhere else and almost never looks at themselves as a reason why things are the way they are. But sin, if left unresolved, unpaid for, simply brings death, being temporary, corporal beings. We live our life of however many years or decades it happens to be, and then we die. And that seems empty for mankind, and it should, because God has designed us with the potential to have so much more. Let's look at 
Romans 6, 23 next. These are all great verses to remember throughout the year, not just on a day such as this Day of Atonement, to be reminded of what it is that we're striving to overcome. Romans 6, 23, Paul here writes simply that the wages of sin is death. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is violating the law. So when we violate the law then, the consequence is death, not eternal life, not eternal death, simply death. We go back to the molecules we came from. But notice, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's offering us the gift of eternal life. But it cannot be as Satan functions. Let's go next to Ephesians chapter 2. And so going back to Satan, we find that he has great power. Ephesians 2 and verse 2 talks about our calling. And how we were dead in our sins in verse 1, which we've covered. So in verse 2, then he says, speaking of those sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. You know, it's disingenuous. I can't imagine anybody that would want to get into politics in this day and age. It doesn't matter if you live a clean life. Somebody will simply make something up. And yet the world goes on with these things. The course of the world. You and I came out of that. By God's grace and mercy, he gave us a calling to understand the world as it is. And so the rest of the world just continues because they don't know any different right now. But we once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We have a better understanding of that now in this day and age than they did back when Paul wrote this. We understand there's all kinds of influence floating around us in radio waves. If you have the right device, you tune into it. Satan is broadcasting on our frequency, and it's tweaked for every one of us. What he can get you to do may be something I'm not even interested in. And so he feeds us this on a regular basis. The prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. When Christ talked about Satan being a murderer from the beginning and the father of lies, this is what he was referring to, this spirit of disobedience. And so Satan broadcasts a desire to sin on mankind's wavelength. He entices mankind to sin by rejecting God's instruction, by whispering in our ears the same lie he told in the garden. Did God really say? Is that what he meant? Let's go back to Job chapter 1. We get our greatest insight into how Satan works through these chapters. We've been through the book of Job in Bible studies, and it's just such a great insight, not only to understand... Job's struggles and what God was seeking to teach him, but Job is unique in the Old Testament in that we understand things beyond our physical realm of understanding. We get a glimpse at God's throne. Job 1 and verse 12, Satan has come before God's throne here, and the Eternal says to Satan, Behold, all that he has in your power. Satan had brought an accusation of Job to God. God says, have you considered him? Well, he only follows you because you bless him. If you take away, and he went through a list, didn't he? It was this, and then it was that, and then it was the next. If you take these things away, he'll curse you. He's only in it for what he can get out of it. So God here is saying, okay, well, let's test your theory. All that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on this person. You can't hurt him. But everything around him, you have free reign on. So we know the story, don't we? The loss of his wealth in terms of the animals that he had. The loss of those that were in his employ. The loss of his immediate family with the exception of his wife. And then later, even the loss of his health. 
Satan has power, but he has power under the authority of God. We see this again in verse 6 of chapter 2. Satan comes back after it doesn't work. And so then he says, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Now you can afflict Job himself, but you can't kill him. I'm sure Job thought, because we can read that in there, Job thought it would have been better if he had died. But through these verses, we gain insight into the accusatory spirit. You could read, go back and reread, especially the first two or three chapters of Job, and see how Satan just keeps kind of poking it all. Satan harbors this anger, not only against God, but against mankind. Because mankind is ultimately going to be above the angels. And for someone full of pride, that's a hard reality to face. Let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 2. I think this really irritates Satan as well. He thinks he's so full of it that he's the sum perfection as we read. That he, if he's just had enough time or the right opportunity, he could depose God. And yet in verse 1 we find here, Job 2, that he still has to report to God. There came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the eternal, and Satan also came amongst them to present himself. They still have to come before God. I can only imagine how awkward those conversations are. Let's go next to 2 Corinthians 4. We're talking about Satan having certain power and jurisdiction that God allows this. In 2 Corinthians 4, and in verse 4, we read here that Satan has blinded the minds of those in the world. 2 Corinthians 4, and verse 4, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. And so some will say, well, why? Why would God do that? Well, the holy days show this plan of salvation. Now is not the time God is working with the bulk of humanity. He's working with a select few because Satan has been given this rulership for now. And yet God still uses that, doesn't he? You develop muscle by working against resistance. And spiritually, it's no different that God can use if you will, Satan's rebellion to help us become part of his family. I, I cannot fathom the mind of Satan. None of us should be able to. Because to think about this, he kills the Son of God thinking he's going to stop God's plan. And in fact, that action only helps to ensure it. <laughs> How angry does that now make him? He thinks by enticing us to sin, that's going to bring us to death. But now with that sacrifice, we have a covering for that sin, a payment for that sin, that God can put his spirit in us, and we begin to take on his mind, the anger that Satan must have. And yet he never relents. But this rulership of Satan is now characterized by darkness, not light. Evil, not good, even though Satan can present himself as all of those things. Let's look at chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 14. Breaking into the thought here, he's speaking of Satan. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. There was the expression back in the 70s. You know, if it feels good, do it. Well, look at the consequences that came out of that. But that's the, the view of the world, isn't it? I might as well enjoy life. And they don't stop to think about what God has designed for us. They buy into the lie because Satan has made it look appealing. It feel, the problem with sin, do you know the problem with sin? Why is sin hard to overcome? It feels good. Whatever the sin is, whatever it is that entices us, if we're angry, it feels good to express that anger and to just break people. If it's sensuous pleasure, 
then we can do that to, to our heart's desire, and we think that's what we want. It's disguised as good. It's disguised as light, something good. This word transformed here in the Greek can also mean disguised. He has a mask on. He looks one way, but at his core, he's something completely different. Satan has disguised himself as an angel of light, claiming truth, claiming goodness, and so forth, by lying to mankind. And there are a number of verses that speak to this. But there's power. In Luke 22, verse 53, Christ talks about the power of darkness, as does Paul in Colossians 1, verse 13. There is great power. Look at what Satan has been able to do through mankind. The evil that's been afflicted. But let's go to John 12 next. John 12 and verse 31. Christ here says, in speaking about his impending death, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Meaning that Christ had qualified by living a sinless life, by now qualifying to be the blood payment in our stead for all of mankind. Now the ruler has no authority to continue on that throne. And so we see it's temporary. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 4. I always find this story very intriguing. This is the story of Christ before his public ministry began and the fasting of 40 days in the wilderness. There's disagreement amongst some as to how this wording is. Some think that the temptation came at the end of the 40 days. My personal interpretation is that the temptation was the whole 40 days. If you're weak when you're hungry, can you imagine what Christ went through? And so in Matthew 4 and verse 8, we find then Satan trying to entice the Son of God. Now think of the arrogance of this. This is the pride of Satan. The being, the person standing before him is the one who created him. And this is what he's saying. Satan took him up to an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory, a panoramic view of everything that mankind had managed to achieve at that point. And Satan then says to Christ, all of these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Now, again, the arrogance of it all. But let's think a little deeper here. How could he offer all of this, if it was not his, it'd be an empty thing, wouldn't it? Christ wouldn't have answered the way he would have. Christ would have said, it's not yours. But Christ answered differently, didn't he? In verse 10, away with you, for it is written, you shall worship the eternal God and him only. And so then, verse 11, Satan left him, and the angels came and ministered to Christ. Again, this would not have been a temptation if Satan didn't have it to give. But even that would have been temporary, wouldn't it? God would have worked this out some way. God's hand is not shortened. But Christ knew that this offer from Satan at best was a temporary offer. Coming from a being who had rebelled, that he had created. But Christ did qualify to replace Satan as ruler of this world. And he will do so in the near future. We picture that coming in the Feast of Trumpets. We look forward to the time when Christ will return to begin to reestablish God's government. And all that will flow from that. Let's go next to 1 Corinthians 15. This is what we rehearsed last week. 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. No longer limited in this physical life. No longer under the sway of Satan in this world. The world will begin to change, literally, in every way. And then in verse 17, uh, 57, sorry, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Satan does not have permanent power over mankind and God's creation. It's temporary. And I can only imagine that as time runs out more and more, how much angrier Satan is going to be. Satan is not an ordinary opponent, though. It's hard enough to do physical battle, to fight someone physically. How do we fight a spiritual being? He's an extremely resourceful and cunning adversary. He whispers things in our ears at times that doesn't sound like it's coming from him. Seems very reasonable until we begin to see the consequences. But he does all of this not to help us, but rather to destroy us. Because there's a big part of Satan as well that says, if I can't have it, God won't either. And so he leads mankind astray. He entices them to sin. He turns them against God. And he brings death. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians 6 and verse 12, Paul writes, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, those in authority, those in rulership, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this age. We have a spiritual battle. It says here, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We fight against this, and without God we're powerless as the balance of mankind is. If I were to give this sermon on some public forum, radio or TV, most people would simply tune out. They would go on to something else. They don't see this as a reality. It seems foolishness. But it is playing out. We find in 2 Corinthians 2, that Satan takes advantage of us, takes advantage of mankind to do his will. Again, he puts it in this package of good, of light, of something beneficial, and yet it destroys and it takes. Let's look at that in Luke chapter 8. This is why I say Satan's way of life is the antithesis of God's way of life. I am sure that we will read, that we will rehearse at some point during next week in the Feast of Tabernacles, the verse in Isaiah that talks about the increase of his government, there will be no end. And I have mentioned recently, that seems counterintuitive to us physically. Because when we hear the increase of government, we hear in our minds, we hear taxes, regulations, burdens, <laughs> restrictions. But again, at the core, who and what is God? He is love. That love is going to expand and expand and deepen and deepen. And yet in Luke 8, we find something completely different in the mind of Satan. Luke 8 and verse 12, it says, Those by the wayside, here's, he's explaining the parable of the sower. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Going back to the height of our former association, the Worldwide Church of God, we were publishing 7 million magazines a month. Plain Truth Magazine, 7 million. We were second only to the Reader's Digest here in this country. Where are those people? How many of them read whatever it happened to be? At some part of their mind said, this makes some sense. And then Satan 
has them put the magazine down and walk away and go right back to the life they had before they read that. He comes and he takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Satan takes. Revelation 9 talks about him being a destroyer. Look at how much has been destroyed in mankind's history through war and famine and disease. In 2 Corinthians 6, he's, talked, he's given the title of that wicked one. 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5, he's called a tempter. None of those are positive attributes. And yet even in the world, there will be some that will say, yes, they can be. This is how deep the lie is that Satan has permeated, perpetuated on mankind. Because at the core, Satan is the one responsible for sin in the world. He brought it in. We bear our own culpability in acting on it, but he brought sin into the world. Remember the deception that he perpetuated in the garden. He did this whisper campaign against God. Did he really say? He's hiding things from you because he knows that you'll become a god. He lied to them when he told them they wouldn't die. Satan wants mankind to follow his way of sin so that Satan would have control, so that mankind would not see his potential, that mankind would die, and in Satan's mind would then, therefore, never be a part of God's family. But that's the beauty, again, of God's plan, isn't it? The last great day pictures all of those people who have ever lived and died, never knowing God's plan of salvation. They are not lost forever. They will have opportunity to be in God's family. But to go back to the story, Satan didn't approach Adam and Eve with an outright lie. And this only reinforces the old truism. The secret of a good lie is to have a little bit of truth in it. They didn't die on that day, did they? They ate the fruit, they looked around, they're still alive. They died 900 years later, and you think, 900 years? <laughs> but they still died, didn't they? Satan told Adam and Eve that they would become gods if they ate of the forbidden fruit. It may not have been what they thought God meant, but they did become a god, their own god. But God desires for mankind to be in his family, to be God as he is God. This will reflect God's nature, his character. Satan's lie was that mankind could be God without godly attributes. But since the Garden of Eden, then, we've borne the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not just Adam and Eve's sin, it's mankind's sin, because we've all agreed to the same terms. That tree brought murder and selfishness, anger, malice, envy, every other satanic characteristic you could think of. Because Satan's lie fundamentally was, you are a god to do as you please. Then to build on all those attribute, attributes, Satan then promoted a false religion, a worship of self. But also false gods promoted to be more important or more powerful than the God who created all. Satan was so successful at promoting this lie that religion became empty. Because if it's not a true God being worshipped, why are we doing this? Mankind realized to a small degree then the emptiness of these false religions. And so we've come to a point where more and more and more people simply walk away from any form of religion saying a god, believing in any god, is simply a myth created in ignorant ancient history. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 5 next. We are increasingly getting to this point in the culture around us. The largest growing demographic in terms of religion are what the pollsters call the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, nuns. They have no religion, and they don't want any religion. 
And so then what's the standard? Without a law, what is the standard? Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. God's standards are turned on their heads. Woe to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Satan was able early on in mankind's history to also promote the lie that mankind needed protectors other than God. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. So men like Nimrod convinced the masses that they needed to trust a few to govern them. The strongest, the smartest, the most powerful, whatever, that they didn't need God. God was the one who killed all those innocent people in the flood. God is the one who allows those young children to die unnecessarily in untimely deaths. God is the one who allows these wars to take place. God is the one who doesn't take care of us. And so then Satan has promoted, in addition to this, that we will live forever. And that there's an immoral aspect of life that he promotes. Sex without boundaries, escapism and entertainment, deviant lifestyles and personal choices. As it was put in the late 60s and early 70s, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But as a destroyer, Satan has promoted an anger and a violence that simmers under the surface of almost everything mankind seeks. Have you noticed how angry people are? It's at the root of every conflict, whether it's in families, whether it's in churches, whether it's in individuals. Because hate, Satan also hates discipline. He hates love as it is defined by God. And he has promoted this culture of self first and self foremost. That was the lie he told Christ in Matthew 4, wasn't it? If you fall down and worship me. Satan's statement to Christ would have been an empty thing, as I said, if it were not true, because he does have rulership over this world for now, but it is not forever. It will not last. But from Satan's throne, he looks out at the state of the world, and I suspect he's very pleased to see mankind on such a destructive path. He succeeded in the world of Noah. How many people died in that flood? We have no idea. Potentially billions. When you look at the lifespans and the exponential population growth. And if he succeeded in that world in bringing them to this brink of extinction, then he could certainly do it again. And in that way, he probably couldn't be happier. And yet, in spite of all of that success, if you want to use that word, in turning mankind from God, I believe Satan has never been more angry. Let's go back to Matthew 24. We know from Scripture that Christ is returning. Again, we rehearse these in the Holy Days, and specifically in the Feast of Trumpets, that he is going to rule with authority under the Father. He's going to change not only the face of the world, this earth, he's going to change the very nature of the creation. But knowing his time is short to rule, Satan will step up his efforts to destroy mankind and to try to undo everything God is planning for mankind. As I've said, maybe you've known these individuals. If I can't have it, nobody will. In Matthew 24 and verse 3, we have here the disciples asking, what will it look like in the end time? What should we be aware of to prepare, to prepare for? And so he says to them in verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you. The problem with deception is you don't know when you're being deceived, do you? <laughs> Again, a good lie has an element of truth in it. Verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and deceive many. How many follow a Christ that is not the Christ in scripture? It's a false Christ. 
You'll hear of wars and rumors of war and see that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass. It will get worse and worse and worse as time progresses. Nations rising against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. And some will say, well, we've had those things down through history. We've had them terrible at times. But Christ is talking about a time, as we'll see here in a moment, that if it was not stopped, all life would be erased. Mankind did not achieve that capability until the middle of the 1900s. Verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, and they'll betray one another, and they'll hate one another. And I have to say, based on what I understand from Scripture, I think most of that turning will come from individuals who know us, not from people who don't. Verse 11, verse 11, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, what is lawlessness? 1 John 3, 4, sin. Because sin will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And look how cold the world has gotten around us. This is the world we have now. But let's look at verse 21. There will be a great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world. The level and to the extent this will permeate the world around us, literally, we will have never seen such a thing. Not since the beginning of the world until this time, nor shall ever be again. Verse 22, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Mankind would succeed, Satan would succeed in promoting such evil and such hatred that we would wipe all life off the face of this planet. But that's not the end of the story. Notice the last part of verse 22. But for the elect's sake, those days would be shortened. This is a rhetorical question for you to answer in your mind, sort of. Do you ever think much about how much of a role you play in the rest of mankind being able to be in God's family? For the elect's sake, for your sake, for my sake, for every other person who has humbled themselves before God, taken on his characteristics, followed his law and instruction to take on his nature, God says, because of that, I won't let that destruction happen, that ultimate ending of life. But verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And as I've said recently, they're going to mourn because they see the ending of a way of life they want. This evil world, as bad as it is, they keep thinking, well, if we can just have more time or more money or more whatever, we can fix this. They're not going to want to see this world go away. Satan has so saturated the minds of mankind with this lie that they don't want anything else. But they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, Satan's role as ruler of this world will not continue forever. And God will bring something better. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. So we have about four and a half hours left for sundown. I'm about halfway through my message. Is that okay? No, I won't take you that long. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Part of the joy in the days 
like this, this Day of Atonement, but all of God's holy days, part of the joy is knowing that Satan will not be able to continue this lie forever. God will step in and stop mankind from destroying all life. God will send his son back to reestablish his government to show mankind what God intended from the beginning. We are so used to this world. I know I've said this, many others have as well. We're so used to this world, we have a hard time imagining something different. But I'm looking forward to a day when there are no mosquitoes. <laughs> they are terrible this year. You go outside and you literally have a swarm around you. It's so wet this year. And yet if you were out west, you would be done with fires, wouldn't you? Or those that are submerged in North Carolina or those that are dying from famine in Africa, or we could go around, but we're, we think this is normal. This is not normal. But Satan is going to have this wrath that I'm talking about. Notice there, he has come down to you having great wrath, great anger. And he's not initially going to go after the world because they're in lockstep with him. Why would you punish somebody who is following you? Go back to Revelation chapter 2. He's initially going to come after God's church, his people. They're the ones. We won't have to say anything in the end time. In fact, people won't hear it. Amos 8.11, that there's going to be a famine of the hearing of the word. People will not want to hear it. But there we are, dressing up and Saturday morning going off to church. Where are you off to on a Saturday? Wednesday, in the middle of the week, going off to church. What are you doing? <laughs> going to college, and two days later, having to talk to your professors about next week being gone for the feast. You had all summer to take your break. Why are you waiting until now? We're going to stand out, and that's going to focus Satan's anger. Revelation 2, verse 10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Now, Christ was speaking to a specific audience, if you will, of his people, a specific time, primarily, but there are attributes that apply across time to God's people. Don't fear those things that you might suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, that you will have tribulation ten days, be faithful till death, and I will give you the crown of life. Is what God is offering of more value than your life? If the answer is no, then you might as well just walk out the door now. Save yourself a whole lot of trouble. But if you want what God is offering, then we need to be grounding ourselves in his word thoroughly. We need to be drawing close to him as we rehearse in this day to have that humility that we can bow our knees before him to know that it is only through him that we have any hope of eternal life. But during this end time persecution, as we look forward, Satan gives power to two individuals, great power called the beast and the false prophet. He gives them power to perform miracles. And I have cautioned people in the past that look towards miracles. I said, be very careful because even Satan can perform miracles. Those miracles that they will do will subdue people. It will change the course of mankind's history. They will have such great power, and they will turn people from God. Revelation 9 and verse 1, we won't read the whole chapter, but this begins the beginning of the end for Satan. God is ultimately in charge. As much as Satan wants to pretend that he, God is not, as much as Satan wants to promote to mankind that God is not, God is in charge, and he will not allow mankind to destroy all life. But he will go down fighting, as I've said, still believing, and this is just the truly amazing thing to me, to the very end, he will believe that he still has the possibility of dethroning God. And so in chapter 9, if you want to read that later today, perhaps it talks about this time of the fifth trumpet and what we call the Battle of Armageddon, all these armies that amass initially to fight each other. That's how bad it's gotten. 
down to this one final battle, this one knockdown drag out, who is going to control everything? And then as Christ begins to return, as we've read earlier, and as we rehearsed in the Feast of Trumpets, they turn their anger, the anger that Satan has promoted against each other. They're going to turn that anger against Christ as he comes back. And so then we have this great battle at the end, verse 11. It's called a baton. In Greek, the same name, Apollyon. And if I remember correctly, it means destroyer. We picture the understanding of all that God gives to his people in the holy days. We picture this time of Christ's return and the Feast of Trumpets. We picture the setting aside, the, the banishing of Satan for a thousand years, starting with this Day of Atonement, and how only because he's removed can God usher in a millennial reign of his son for a thousand years. We picture all of that in the hope of what God offers us because he is not a liar we can stand firm on those promises to know the future that awaits us and all of the rest of mankind. That when Jesus Christ returns, he will implement these things. And that he'll influence mankind in the right way. And so, if you want to write in your notes, Revelation 18, verses 21 to 24, we see in the very end time the fall of Babylon. The system that Satan perpetuated from after the flood has permeated every aspect of mankind's cultures, no matter where they are in the world. All of that will end, and it will fall. The Day of Atonement is important because God shows us the removal of mankind from the affairs of man. No longer will he be broadcasting sinful thoughts and actions. No longer will he be whispering in the ears to disobey God and to rebel, Satan will no longer be able to perpetuate the lie he started in the garden. Let's go back to Leviticus 16. We just have a couple of verses I want to turn to to highlight the meaning of this day as we've covered already. But Leviticus 16 and in verse 29 we have here in this chapter, this is very interesting, a whole chapter dealing about just this day. And in verse 29, Leviticus 16, God here says through Moses, This shall be a statute forever for you. This day of atonement we are to keep forever. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, this is today. This is why we are here, to assemble before God, to hear his word expounded. To be reminded, as it says next, to afflict our souls, to be humbled, as we were told earlier, and shown. To realize that we are not the be-all, end-all. As much as we might want to think we are a God, we are nothing. If God decided to just simply stop caring, we would disappear. We're to do no work whether it's somebody that's native to the land or a stranger dwelling amongst us, that everyone should pause and think about why we're here to consider what God has done and is doing for us. Mr. Schultz didn't read this verse, but I had it in my notes. Let's go to Psalm 35. Psalm 35 and verse 13. But as for me, when they were sick, this is David here, my clothing was sackcloth. This was done as an outward expression of this sorrow internally. Later on, it became a badge of righteousness, which defeated the whole purpose of it. But David here says, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, and my prayer would return to my own heart to be humbled before God. You and I, of all people, should be humbled this day because out of the billions of people on the face of the earth, we're not even a fraction of a percent. And yet he's called us, given us his understanding, his spirit, 
to be part of the first fruits, to be there when Christ returns, to be re resurrected as spirit beings, to then assist Christ in teaching the world how to live. James 4, as we conclude then. The beauty of God having us fast on this day is that if we just wanted to talk about spiritual points of doctrine, most of us would have eyes that glass over. We would tune out because we have nothing to connect it to. But we understand being hungry. We develop habits. It was a really hard thing getting up this morning because the first thing I do in the morning after I get up and put my contacts on and get dressed is I pour myself a bowl of cereal. It's just a habit. You go to the cupboard and it's like, mm, not today. James 4 and verse 7. Therefore, submit yourself to God. We picture submission. This is not a surrendering of will. This is an acknowledgement of God's power and authority. We submit to him because he is the giver of all. He is the one who sustains all. He is the one who is going to bring all of this to fruition because of his love. So then, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Satan has no power over us that we do not give him. That sounds simplistic, but it is the reality. With God's spirit working in us, that should become easier and easier and easier over time. Verse 8, draw near to God. We're reminded when we do without food and we do without water what we need. And we gravitate to where that need can be fulfilled, don't we? To get hungry, we go to the kitchen. Draw near to God. The hunger that we feel today should remind us of the hunger that we should have spiritually. To never be very far from God. The source of satiating that spiritual hunger. That he will give us everything that we need. That he will draw near to us. We will no longer be separated as mankind was since the garden. We are not separated now. He has given us a calling that we can walk before him. We can go before his very throne in prayer because of what Christ has done for us. To have that relationship. God is not an angry God. That's Satan. God is not a capricious God. That's Satan. God is not a God without mercy or patience, long-suffering, or love. All of those aspects are Satan. So we cleanse our hands as sinners. We purify our hearts, and we cease to be double-minded. One foot in the world, one foot in the church, will not work. We learn more of God's plan of salvation as we progress. So then, verse 9, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning so that we remember this is not the life that God offers. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. This day of atonement is a day of hope. On this day, when Christ fulfills its meaning, the world will no longer have Satan's lies and the sin he promotes to contend with. We are fighting a spiritual war against Satan in order to have a relationship with God as he intended from the beginning. And on this day, we know that with God's help, we will win that war. This day of atonement is a day of reconciliation. It's a day of repairing a relationship that Satan destroyed from the beginning. A day of being at one with God, without the interference of Satan. This day is a day of humility as we see all that God is doing so that mankind has the potential to be in his very family. Let us then rejoice in this day of atonement.